Omar Moore here from the Politocrat Daily Podcast with this very important message to stop hate against the AAPI communities. Stop the violence and stop the hate against Asian American Pacific Islander communities. This call is an urgent call. Please visit Stop AAPI Hate. O-R-G. There are days, this is one of them, when you wonder what your role is in this country and what your future is in it. Mm-hmm. How precisely are you going to reconcile yourself to your situation here and how you are going to communicate to the vast heedless, unthinking, cruel, white majority that you are here. I'm terrified at the moral apathy, the death of the heart, which is happening in my country. These people have deluded themselves for so long that they really don't think I'm human. I had basis on their conduct, not on what they say. And this means that they have become, in themselves, moral monsters. Welcome to The Politocrat. I'm Omar Moore. It is Thursday, April the 15th, 2021. On this edition of The Politocrat... Who, what, why, and what the hell? (laughs) That is coming up next. One country at a cost of billions each year, makes little sense to me and to our leaders. We cannot continue the cycle of extending or expanding our military presence in Afghanistan, hoping to create ideal conditions for the withdrawal and expecting a different result. I'm now the fourth United States president to preside over American troop presence in Afghanistan. Two Republicans, two Democrats. I will not pass this responsibility onto a fifth. After consulting closely with our allies and partners, with our military leaders and intelligence personnel, with our diplomats and our development experts, with the Congress and the Vice President, as well as with Mr. Ghani and many others around the world, I've concluded that it's time to end America's longest war. It's time for American troops to come home. President Joe Biden yesterday delivering remarks announcing the withdrawal of the United States from its presence in Afghanistan where it has been for 20 years now almost 20 years and thank goodness I mean first of all my immediate reaction and and thank you dear listener for um, joining me here on this April the 15th tax day but tax day deferred for those of you who have already got your refunds, great, but if you're someone who pays your, or has to pay your taxes, (laughs) someone who has to pay, someone who pays, (laughs) if you are someone who owes money, put it that way, um, then you've still got a month plus to go. May 17th is the deadline for you to file your taxes and uh, put that check in the mail or whatever you do when you have to Um, When your method of payment, I should say. And by the way, before I go back to President Biden, speaking of methods of payment, you right now can pay with a credit card. You can pay with PayPal at the Politocrat Daily Podcast Store at the-politocrat.myshopify.com. All of the merchandise is available for yours, from yours truly, to yours truly, to you, I mean. (laughs) So please join 
Um, well, please get to the store now. It's the dash politocrat dot my shopify dot com and new items added every day. Yes, there's lots of T-shirts, but there's also lots of other merchandise that's coming and that is there and that is being added. So please do yours truly a a favor. Um, well, just not even a favor. Just to <laughs> please patronize the store is whatever what I'm getting at as I uh, unscramble myself on this episode here at the dash politocrat dot my shopify dot com. And. You know, I, I uh, you know, there's a great T-shirt, by the way, that's there that I've just added um, for the Electric Sound Wave series. The Electric Sound Wave series. Um, they, I think you'll really like. It's a nice black T-shirt with really, uh, it's very colorful, old gold style with maroon. It's just, it's really nice. It's a nice shirt. So please check it out. Buy it today. President Biden yesterday, I want to get back to to him because there's a lot to cover on this edition of the Politocrat Daily Podcast. And President Biden yesterday, you heard the audio there for a few moments of him yesterday uh, at the White House in a location exactly where George W. Bush was 20 years ago almost uh, and announcing that he is withdrawing United States military from Afghanistan. And it's a... It's an announcement that has long been welcomed by so many people. You know, what were we doing in Afghanistan? I mean, obviously, we were told the mission was to hunt down and excavate, if you will, Osama bin Laden. But we know very well in the caves of Tora Bora, and I guess it was October or November of 2001, he had been spotted. And the story is, is that he slipped away or he was let go by uh, military forces, U.S. military forces. So, or a combination thereof, uh, the Northern Alliance or whomever. Remember the Northern Alliance? They've basically become the so-called quote-unquote insurgents. I remember all that in 2001. I don't know how, um, if you remember it, but that was the group that was supposed to be on the side of the United States. Um, And apparently they and some combination of U.S. forces had let Obama, Obama, oh dear. I know, that's what happens, right? You get the um, Obama and Osama mixed up and, you know, that is kind of, well, weird. But it happens. But Osama bin Laden was able to escape and they let him escape really and then we had 10 more years of this and then in 2011 I mean it was just crazy I mean I do want to go over this by way of history because I do think it's important that people not forget because we have forgotten haven't we about Afghanistan and why we've We've completely forgotten that, you know, I mean, that that was, um, you know, it was October the 7th of 2001 and we were so gung ho and we were so, oh, great, you know, (laughs) but, you know, this is what happened on 2000 and in 2011. I mean, listen to this from President Obama. Leader. Good evening. Tonight, I can report to the American people and to the world that the United States has conducted an operation that killed Osama bin Laden, the leader of al-Qaeda, and a terrorist who's responsible for the murder of thousands of innocent men, women, and children. And so that was on May 1st, 2011, President Obama announcing that operation that ended up being successful. They wanted to get Osama bin Laden, and they killed him. So for them, that was a success. And many of us were saying, that's great, but why didn't you just capture him and bring him to trial? And that question wasn't sufficiently answered, I think, by those who were jumping up and down. I mean, I was certainly happy that they got him and that they um, dusted him off. 
and said uh, adios, although I'm sure they didn't say that. Maybe the CIA said adios because people forget that Osama bin Laden was a CIA trainee. He worked for the CIA. Hello? But let's not tell anybody that because, you know. So, Osama bin Laden was killed in 2011. May 1st, 2011, and it happened. And that was also the very same day that uh, President, that night, it was a Sunday night, I remember it well. It was a Sunday night, and President Obama made the statement you just heard. Now look, there were lots of people celebrating, and at the time he was making that statement, it was just a few hours after the killing and it would have been the next day because technically since Afghanistan is a few hours I think seven, six, seven, six, seven, I don't know, hours ahead of Washington DC, it would have been the next day. So actually it happened during the early morning hours of May the second, two thousand and eleven, Afghanistan time. Or at really Pakistan time because it happened in Pakistan where he was killed, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Pakistan may it may have been, it was the location where he was killed. SEAL Team 6, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you know the whole story, and there's a lot that the fallout about that story and about some of the people in that unit and some of the tragedies, some of the other things, some of the wild stuff that went on. And so, technically, it was May the 2nd that Osama bin Laden was killed. And then he was buried in the sea. I think he's actually either he was, his body was dumped in the sea. Uh, anyway, but look, the whole point is, is since he was killed, if the objective in Afghanistan was to root out Al Qaeda and get rid of Osama bin Laden, why the heck was the United States? Why were we there for another 10 years afterwards? Someone will say, well, because ISIS was there. Well, because to prevent. So then what was the killing in aid of then? Someone will say, well, because of 9-11. Well, I don't know that we've ever had conclusive proof that Osama bin Laden was behind all of this. I mean, he probably, look, I believe he was behind it. But do we have conclusive proof of that? Remember that bogus video that was released, I think, a short time within a week or two or three after again, this requires that you really dig back into memory because some people do not remember this. Many people may not remember this, but do you remember there was this videotape released of Osama bin Laden saying, "Yeah, well, I did it, and I sell it. You know, we got them, and did it. Was it successful? Yeah, great. Do you remember that?" And I was looking at that video at the time in two thousand one, going, "This is not him. This is fake." And not only that. Who would put out a videotape like that? Well, I'm sure there are people who would. But come on now. You've just disrupted the United States with this really horrific terrorist attack that killed 2,977 people inside the United States. And you would put yourself on video talking about how you did. It's, that's really forced. And I think that was a complete staging. Now, I could be wrong, but there have been some who have said that that tape is not authentic and that it's not verifiable. It's complete garbage. It seems like something maybe the CIA might do. I don't know. But the CIA even wouldn't do something that trippy because the CIA is too sophisticated for that. And I'm saying that as not someone who has any expertise in the CIA. I just have... I mean, based on books I've read and based on my own acquired knowledge uh, in, in research, the CIA doesn't act like that, at least not that openly and obviously. I mean, there's lots of things the CIA does. You know, it operates in the shadows, if you will, to borrow a phrase from Darth Vader himself. And you know who I'm talking about. The guy that was really president but pretended to be vice president. <laughs> you know who that is. Whose daughter now is being presented as this font of reason and wisdom in the Republican Party, who is also, by the way, his daughter, I don't know if she still is, but had been very much an anti-gay person to the point where she was anti-gay against her own sister, who is gay. 
You know which family I'm talking about. But in any event, anywho, so this is this is the thing. Why, 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 why? The CIA would, would, would not, I don't think, do something like this. And that video was really just, I think, designed to be propaganda to convince the American public that, yeah, this guy definitely did it then. And it was kind of designed as this, okay, let's close the book on this. And then you had the 9-11 Commission and, and all the politics around that. And then all the, the book for the findings got released. And we we're all sitting here going, okay, that's like the Warren Commission with their sloppy findings and the magic bullet theory. <laughs> so the, you know, the 9-11 Commission, you know, it was just a, a, a rush job to put a tiny, nice, neat little bow around things and dust your hand off, your hands off and go, well, well, there, there, that's it. And so that's exactly what I think happened. And so there you go. And then 10 years later, we're still in Afghanistan. In fact, right now, as I speak, dear listener, the United States of America is still in Afghanistan. And I just do not understand why on earth we are there other than for oil, other than for more financial profit for big companies like the company of the guy who pretended to be vice president but was actually president, you know, Halliburton, that company. Why is the United States still there? Still today, still there. Even after President Biden yesterday, with his statement, said what he said. The actual withdrawal was supposed to be for May the 1st, which is in two weeks. Two weeks from now. May the 1st was supposed to be the date. And that is what I think... Joe Biden or President Biden, I forget whether he was just Joe Biden at the time or whether he was President Biden at the time. I think he was Joe Biden at the time. Uh, and others had said was going to be the agreement. I think it was agreed upon even before Joe Biden walked in. It was other people that said May 1st is the deadline. Maybe it was the Joint Chiefs or whomever. May 1st, we're going to withdraw American military personnel. I don't like the word troops. So I try to say things like military personnel or, you know, Instead of troops, you know, I get it. Or, or I, I say soldiers, I, troops. It sounds just like, yeah, I don't know. Me and language, I'm just so persnickety about this because it's not even just being persnickety. It's about really, uh, and I get it. For some, it might be exhausting to hear me going on about, well, I want to use this word. Well, I want, words matter though. And it's not that exhausting to do. It's about training your brain to try to think about things and speak about them differently. And you will be surprised. Within a few days, you will slip into that. Unless you yield to bad habits. <laughs> but that's what happens. But my point here is that we've been in Afghanistan for 10 more years after the announcement I just played from President Obama from May the 1st, 2011. And we're going to go through that period of time, past that, 20, 10 years on. We're two weeks away from that being exactly 10 years. And so President Biden said, yes, we're going to withdraw, but it's not going to be until September 11th of this year. It's this whole symbolism around September 11th. And I just think that that's really silly. And I also think that it's more to it than that. It's about some other things that are going on that have been discussed behind the scenes that need to take place over the next four months after May the 1st of 2021. And it's being packaged as, well, we want to do it on this anniversary, which there is no, I don't call that an anniversary. You call your wedding uh, an anniversary. You call your, you know, your being together an anniversary. You call, you know, that's your anniversary of your promotion, of your this or your that. That's a, not the deaths of 2,977 people. That's not an anniversary. You know, that's not for celebrating. So for some reason, though, President Biden has said, no, let's delay it until September the 11th, 2021. That's exactly 20 years after, on the 20th year of what happened, that terrorist attack, which devastated this country, devastated at least New York City and uh, Shanksville, PA, and 
the Pentagon in Arlington, Virginia. Or Langley, you know, Langley, Virginia. But, you know, I mean, this is just... I don't know. Anyway, I just want to just talk about that for a few minutes. I mean, it's been a... There's been a lot going on. And there is, I'm telling you, there's a lot more going on um, in this kind of, as I put it, where, what, why, and what the hell episode of the Political Daily Podcast. So stick with me. I'll be right back. I can read this instruction to the jury. Uh, It's titled, Defendant's Right Not to Testify. The state must convince you by evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty of the crime charged. The defendant has no obligation to to prove innocence. The defendant has the right not to testify. This right is guaranteed by the federal and state constitutions. You should not draw any inference from the fact that the defendant has not testified in this case. Do you understand that instruction? Yes, Your Honor. Would you like that read to the jury? Yes, Your Honor. Have you had enough time to talk to Mr. Nelson about whether that's a good idea or not? I have, Your Honor. All right. And so I will read that to the jury on your request. Thank you. All right. Welcome back. That was the defendant, Derek Chauvin, in court today, speaking to the judge. And you heard Judge Cahill in the Hennepin County Court. As they talked about whether or not he was going to testify. And you heard that, and you just heard it there, that the defendant will not be testifying in the defense case, which is no surprise. So he didn't testify. Um, and uh, from a defense point of view, for, from their point of view, not mine personally, but their point of view, that was the right thing to do. And from a legal point of view, that was the right thing to do. It was speaking as an attorney, that is the right thing to do. You don't want to put your, if you are a defendant's attorney, you do not want to put your client on the stand. You just don't want to do that. It just doesn't end well. It really does not. You open yourself up to being carved open, literally. And, well, you know what I mean. Not literally, as in scalpels and... I don't want to go any deeper into that. But you get what I mean. So the defendant did not testify and the defense rested their case and the prosecution, that defense, that defense case was, by the way, I'm not going to just gloss over that. Come on, let me get back to it. <laughs> Come on over. That defense case was shambolic. They had two days and it was, well, three days, really. Most of Monday almost all of Monday, all of Tuesday, and all of Wednesday. And it didn't even go for, for the full went day on Wednesday. But they had three days. And it was shambolic. Their witnesses were not very convincing at all. And it was ridiculous what was coming out of the mouth of Dr. David Fowler. It was ridiculous what was yesterday... It was ridiculous what was coming out of the mouths of some of these other people like Barry Broad, who was saying, oh, well, you know, he was resting uncomfortably on the asphalt and the golf ball rests uncomfortably on the lip of the cup of the green here on the 18th and a gust of wind might just blow it into the hole. I mean, that's how... Barry Broad was painting this picture that George Floyd's head and face and body was resting uncomfortably on the asphalt. I mean, isn't that just stark raven bonkers? Resting uncomfortably. Isn't that something? Well, it's something. And it's something called a can of bullshit. So that case was shambolic. I mean, Eric Nelson really looks bad. And to think that there was one day during week number one of this trial 
where he actually came out, I think, a little bit ahead of the prosecution. But that wasn't because of him. It was because the prosecution was so poor on that one particular day in week number one of the trial. We're in the third week of the trial now, and we are now toward the end of this trial. So the prosecution began its rebuttal phase today and introduced some new evidence. And it was evidence acquired based upon what one of the defendant's witnesses, Dr. David Fowler, said. And so that is interesting. And it was to do with carbon monoxide and poisoning and things like that and blood oxide levels that um, the prosecutor, Jerry Blackwell, said he wanted to introduce. And I think the judge allowed it in last time I had. Yeah, the judge had looked at it. And so the this is going to be this is something there's new evidence that is part of this case now. And the prosecution is going to use this in their rebuttal. Now, their case, I expect, is going to be. Their rebuttal case is going to be maybe lasting for this particular day, Thursday, and may go into tomorrow, may go into tomorrow. It's possible. Now, I don't know as of the recording of this episode, dear listener, but it's possible that they may actually finish today, the prosecution. They may rest tomorrow. And then the it's very possible that the judge may let the jury out early tomorrow on Friday, early, so that they don't have to, again, I don't get this, you know, I really don't like this. Oh, we don't want you to be sequestered over a weekend. What, why not? Why not? Right? I mean, ooh, we don't want you, you you're being, ugh. they are subject to your jurisdiction, Judge Cahill. You know, these 12 jurors are subject to your jurisdiction. You have power as an officer of the court. And you should be... Anyway, if I was the judge in that case, I wouldn't be talking about, oh, well, you are you would rather have your weekend off. We'd all rather have our weekends off. I think George Floyd's family would rather have their weekend off too. But they don't get to do that. So the idea that these 12 jurors, oh, I'm going to I'm going to have them make their closing arguments on Monday because I want them to have more time and I also want you to have your weekend. <laughs> because I don't think you'd like to come in here on the weekend. Because I don't think you'd like to come in here without your son. Because he was killed by a murdering cop with his knee in his neck. I don't think you'd like to come in on a Saturday. Or a Sunday. There's so many things. You've heard my um, really pointed um, concerns about not only the judge, but this whole trial and this whole case. But again, that's like vinyl hitting. That's like the needle hitting vinyl too many times and skipping. So I'm going to... uh, just leave that as it is. I mean, we are now toward the end of this trial. And quite frankly, it's gone by really quickly. The first week was the longest and the most difficult because the video was shown endlessly. It must have been extremely difficult for the family of George Floyd and those who really cared about him outside the family. Extremely difficult. It was very difficult for the world to be watching that video. And the world is still watching this trial, by the way. It's still being televised around the world. I mean, I think now people have, because of what's been going on, there's a lot of other, you know, events. But still, people are still focusing on this trial. And it's almost over now. At least the the trial phase of of this trial is almost over. Um, You'll have the prosecution, as I said, um, and then it's going to go. I mean, I don't know if there's going to be a re... re, I don't think there... I don't think the defense gets to... Um, come back again. I don't think so. It's usually the process. It's for my. I remember this. I should know this. <laughs> but it's then the, it's the prosecution, and then it goes to the jury, uh, the jury charge, and then they get uh, to go to be sequestered for deliberations. And that's the first time that those jurors can really discuss this case amongst themselves, amongst themselves, to the best of my knowledge. But anyway, there you go. That's the Derek Chauvin murder trial. 
um, going on as I speak to you, and, and or rather, as by the time you listen to this, um, it's you know, it's going on still anyway. So it still counts as as I speak to you. But the trial is in full flow and almost coming to its end before we get to closing arguments, which are, according to Judge Cahill, going to be next week. I want to point to something else, by the way, that happened in this trial yesterday. Uh, I told you about today. Yesterday. You've got to hear this from Eric Nelson. As I said, he has just been... His case was shambolic. I mean, absolutely shambolic here. And he's been shambolic throughout. But, as I keep saying, all it takes is one racist juror, one white juror who says... You know, nah. And as I keep saying to you, dear listener, this is going to come down to what those white jurors think. It's going to come, well, it's going to come out, all 12 of them. But what it's going to come down to is whether, you know, obviously the prosecution has to prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt. My question to you again, dear listener, is do you think they've done that? But even with that, it's still going to go come down to whether or not the white jurors, and I think there's six or seven of them out of the 12, whether those white jurors see black people as human beings, whether those white jurors see us and see our humanity. If they do not see our humanity as black people, this guy is going to go, adios, bye-bye. I don't want that to happen. I'm simply reiterating again that it comes down to that. It comes down to what do those white jurors think about black people? And again, I've said this before. Notice I didn't say what do those white jurors think about George Floyd? I said what do those jurors think of black people? And do they see us as black people, as human beings? Do they see us as human beings? And if they do, there's a good chance. If they don't, there's going to be more hurt and pain for George Floyd's family. I mean, that's the issue here. Do those white jurors recognize the humanity that we have. Because if they don't recognize that, they're going to impute that to George Floyd. That's my point. They're going to impute their, you know, denial of that. Oh, we don't see you. We don't think you're human beings. We think you're animals. We think you're this. Because that's what Eric Nelson has been throwing at them. Oh, superhuman strength. Oh, I wonder what stereotypes those are, racist ones. I wonder where those came from, white people. I wonder where those came from, a white system. I wonder where those came from, Hollywood movies, the culture, the society, racist scientists. He is throwing at them the very culture that we are all swimming in. He is throwing at those white jurors, and all of those jurors, but particularly the white jurors, the country that they live in, that we live in here, if you're living here in the United States. So, hello. As foolish and as stupid and as pathetic as Eric Nelson has been, he is using something that's very tried and true in America, and that's racists and racism, to get his murder and defendant off the hook and to appeal to those white jurors who may not see black people as human beings at all. I mean, the law in this country hadn't. The constitution in this country hadn't. Laws all over this country hadn't. And some still don't. So, come on, folks. This is not some idle banter you're hearing here. This is real. And to that end, this, what I'm going to play for you right now, is hardly... Idol. This is Eric Nelson yesterday. Listen to this as he speaks to Judge Cahill.
Your Honor, um, pursuant to our discussions yesterday uh, in terms of the timeliness of this motion, um, at this point the defense moves pursuant to Minnesota Rule of Criminal Procedure 26.03, Subdivision 18, Paren 1, uh, for a judgment of acquittal in this particular case. I'm sure that the court is very familiar with the legal standards applicable in this case. The court needs to view the evidence as presented in the light most favorable to the state. At this point, Your Honor, the defense admits that the state has fa failed to present sufficient evidence, even in the light most favorable to the state, to establish um, two of the principal issues or uh, arguments in this particular case. Um, the use of force and whether the use of force was reasonable, as well as the cause of death of Mr. Floyd. <laughs> you, he, Eric Nelson, you just heard him. This was yesterday. This is Wednesday. You just heard him there in that audio clip saying that he moves for an acquittal in the case. <laughs> He wants the judge to dismiss the case against the murderer that's sitting five feet to his left. <laughs> and here, here is Judge Cahill's response to that motion for an acquittal. I'm going to deny the defense motion for judgment of acquittal. As you obviously know, Judge Cahill said, get that weak stuff out of here and said, goodbye, sit down, shut up. He said it oh so Minnesota nicely though, didn't he? In that clip. I mean, that's how it works in Minnesota. I've never been there. <laughs> but that is how it works. I mean, it, the, come on. What do you think Minnesota nice is? Although the people who are from Minnesota will tell you that Minnesota nice may have some other connotations or other things that come with it. But the, listen, the whole history of Minnesota as the rest of this country, especially when it comes to police, oh goodness. I've talked about that here. But Judge Cahill said, are you mad, man? What the hell? Speaking of part of the title for this episode, what the hell? But he said it so politely. Well, I'm going to deny the motion. <laughs> I'm going <to> def <laughs> I'm gonna deny counsel's request for defense's request for uh, acquittal. What is Eric Nelson smoking? Actually, it's not a case of him smoking anything. It's just that he's not that good a defense attorney. And never mind the fact that the facts do not favor his client because there's a blooming videotape right there and we all have seen it tr two trillion times. Is that he's just not very good. None of these attorneys are in my view. I think the prosecution really have grown since week number one. I think week two they were very good, much stronger. And I think this week they've been much stronger. I think the key is that they have the... The expert witnesses they have been much more comfortable with, as I have alluded to before on this podcast. They, the prosecution, are much more comfortable, it seems. They they have, because I, I don't know, again, I still shake my head at why the prosecution did not do this great job, in my view, just questioning the witnesses in their case, in their own case, their own case. But they have been really good these last... Well, let me say it like this. The prosecution have been stronger in week two and this week in week three. Much, much better. I'm not saying that they've been grandiloquently brilliant and excellent. I'm just saying they've been much, much better these last, this last nearly two full weeks now. So, Eric Nelson is... He's just trash. He's horrible. Horrible. And... I know Johnny Cochran, God rest his soul, would never have taken this case. But if he had done, he would do, even with these facts being so adverse, he would have done a far better job. I mean, I hate to even be putting like that. I mean, my God, really, I could have done a better job. And I would never defend um, pieces of garbage. And certainly would not defend this murdering piece of trash named Derek Chauvin. I wouldn't do that, dear listener. And I'm not a criminal trial attorney, but if I were, I mean, I've interned in that realm of, uh, of discipline, but I've never uh, tried a case. Um, so in that way, I, you know, I don't have that trial experience as a criminal uh, trial attorney one way or the other, but I've definitely interned uh, at prosecutor's places. I've definitely interned at uh, defense play, you know, at uh, trial, trial attorney's places. 
And come on, any attorney would have done better. Someone who just passed the bar exam and was awaiting swearing in would have done much better. And by the way, congratulations to those. If you're listening and you've recently passed the bar exam, congratulations to you. Uh, you know, here in the U.S. or anywhere where, you, where you've passed exams that mean that you've become a barrister or you've become, you know, whatever it is, wherever you are in the world, congratulations to you. And congratulations on wherever you are in the world in any educational pursuit that you are in and you are coming to the end of that and you're going to go to commencement in the next month or two, socially distanced, I'm sure, uh, or remote, just like last year's was. Congratulations to you. And I'm going to say that again as we get closer. But I don't care who it was. I think anyone pretty much would have done a better job than Eric Nelson has. Anyone. He, I mean, I get it. The facts are not on the side of he or his client because, I mean, come on, the client, his client, his defendant, murdered, tortured Mr. George Floyd to death. So, but my goodness me, you don't have an attorney? I mean, is this guy a court appointment? I don't know. I mean, really, the level of attorney... That he's anyway. I don't really care. I'm not like I really I care personally. I don't. But I'm just saying from a standpoint of a legal standpoint, a legal, not illegal, a legal, a l e g a l, a space legal, not i l l e g a l. <laughs> I do think I just have to spell these things out because sometimes, you know, I may not say something correctly or clearly and someone may hear that and go wait did he say illegal (laughs) a legal perspective Eric Nelson is one of the barrel scrapers bottom of the barrel scrapers isn't he it's kind of fitting to have that kind of attorney for a murdering piece of trash like Derek Chauvin because that's exactly what Derek Chauvin is a piece of garbage and trash needs to be dispensed with. And I really do hope, dear listener, that the jury does just that with Derek Chauvin. I listed several articles in my report of January the 27th. There are several articles in that. I can I can tell you them if you want to. Specifically that stand for that proposition. To, regarding the relationship between lung volume and the hypopharynx. Okay. I have no further questions. Any further? No, Your Honor. All right. Thank you, Doctor. You may step down and you are excused. Okay? Thank you very much. Mr. Blackwell. Your Honor, the state of Minnesota rest. Mr. Nelson, anything further? No, Your Honor. Hey, members of the jury, the evidence is now complete for this case. Uh, next step for you is to listen to closing arguments and then retire for deliberations. That'll occur on Monday. You just heard the audio there. That was the final witness in the case. So during this episode, I mean, just an update here uh, that literally the trial phase of the case has come to a conclusion, it's ended. The person you just heard, first of all, was Dr. Martin Tobin. He was recalled by the prosecution in their rebuttal case. And my goodness, it was a really quick, it was not that long. I mean, it was only, I thought that the prosecution would rest tomorrow, Friday, But no, they're not going to be doing that. They clearly have done that today. They rested their case, as you just heard. Jerry Blackwell there, the Minnesota Assistant Attorney General, saying that the state of Minnesota rests. So that was the last witness, Dr. Martin Tobin, who I think, looking back now, is the strongest, was the strongest, most compelling witness of all of the witnesses. 
and um, did a really good job. I think he's going to be, I think, important in the jury's deliberations for sure. Obviously, the videotape will. We only hope that the jury regard both the videotape on its own, quite frankly, because it pretty much tells you everything, in my view. And um, also the evidence from Martin Tobin. I mean, I, I think that his testimony is extremely important as well. And as are a few other people. But those those two elements, the video plus Dr. Martin Tobin, are going to be factors, I think, in this jury's deliberation. You just heard there also from Judge Cahill as well. Uh, he went on to just advise the jury about their... Um, thinking about packing as if they are going to be there for a long time. He said that their deliberations could be an hour or it could be a week. It's up to you. He's telling that to the jury. It's up to you. He's telling the jurors. He told the jurors today. So there you go. There you go. Welcome back, dear listener. Welcome back to you. Thank you so much for your time. For your ear, you know, I, I really am appreciative of the fact that you listen every day or that you listen some days or you listen for 10 seconds, for 15 seconds, for 15 minutes, for an hour, two hours, however long this episode is. <laughs> Lately, they've been a bit longer. Um, I thank you for sticking with me and sticking with this. Um, and they've been longer for lots of reasons that I think are good. And, you know, I wish that they, well, I wish that there wasn't these murders of black folk. I, I wish that the police would be brought to heel. I wish that this whole system would be. And I'm going to talk a bit about that. But, but I'm going to do this through someone else. Um, because you're going to be hearing from someone else a little bit later on. So stick with me for that. Because I don't think you've listened to this audio. Some of you know Maybe, well, I don't know. I don't think you do know. But you may have heard the audio that I'm going to play a bit later. Um, but these episodes wouldn't have to be so long. I mean, yeah, your editing skills are poor. But <laughs> but it, this, it could be just because there's so much cut to cover. And I'm actually condensing a lot of it, would you believe? <laughs> it's just amazing. It's amazing. It really is. Denmark, by the way, I'm going to just kind of rattle off a few things here. Denmark uh, yesterday became the first uh, country in the world to ban the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccination. The vaccine, I should say. Denmark. And, you know, they have been very clear. Denmark is saying, no, we are not going to have this anymore. I don't care that there's five or six cases of severe blood clots. That's five or six too many. We are shutting it down here in Denmark. See, and I talk about Denmark a lot here, you know, on this program. I've not done it on this podcast. I've not done it for a while. But you will hear me, if you're a regular listener, you will hear me invoke Denmark a lot. Because their systems, while certainly not perfect, and I'm sure there's lots of racism there um, as well, they have a system that takes better care of its citizenry than we do here in the United States. Their education system is better. The way they treat people is better generally. Their whole system of um, criminal justice is run a whole lot better. It is meted out a lot better. Um, the way they treat people who have been incarcerated is a whole lot better, as is Norway's system. They treat the incarcerated like actual human beings. And... Even if they've committed some heinous murder, heinous crime like murder, they are still treated like people once they go into prison. Maybe they're behind bars, they're incarcerated, but they're treated like people and they're spoken to like people, which gives those people an incentive to want to be better people once their sentence is over. Here in the United States, our incarceration is We've got to put you in solitary. We've got to throw you in general population with a bunch of... Like, as, if, as if you're all animals, which is what they treat you as. And the whole idea is punishment, not a so-called rehabilitation. Because we say that rehabilitation is not possible here. 
So we end up putting dog shit in people's food. And then when their sentence is over, we wonder why they commit more crime. We wonder why they do it all again, recidivism rates. And we don't treat them for any kinds of other things going on. I wonder, do health, medical health, or mental health rather, professionals check in with these folks? Or is it just that our, the inherent nature of our penitentiary system is so violent and is so based on profit? You've got whack and hut, supposedly, oh, we've let, no, you, they're probably still in the game, right? These criminal corporations that are making lots of money off the prison industrial complex, which is what the system is. So then they're making money. Inmates are getting put in all these disgusting things and you're dehumanizing the inmate, the person, which I guess what most of us here in America think is supposed to happen. Well, yeah, you took the life of this one, that one and the other. And so therefore we have to be mean and nasty to you. I mean, I don't know. Do you think that that's what the function of imprisonment should be? I really would like to know. Please send an email. Politocratpod at gmail.com Or Facebook, you can find the Politocrat Daily Podcast with the red and uh, golden building logo. Photo. On Facebook. Or you can... Subscribe to the newsletter, which I would love for you to do at politocrat.substack.com and you can send a comment there. Or you can get me on Twitter at the popcorn R-E-E-L. What, what do you I mean? What is it? What, what is the function of imprisonment in the United States? Obviously, the, the easy answer is, well, it is um, a punishment for the crimes committed. Right, that's the immediate thing. But I mean... Once the, that is effectuated, what is the function of what is done while a person is imprisoned? And what do you think that's supposed to be? What's the purpose of that? What do you think it should be? Because if it's just about putting dog crap into people's food and depriving them of sunlight, does that, do you think that's effective? Do you think that's going to stop someone from committing more crime? Isn't it not the system itself that needs to be really disinfected and once more gotten rid of? Again, I'm going to tilt toward this direction a little bit later, I promise. And it's not going to be too much later. But I just want to leave that out there for you. Denmark doesn't treat its people with such barbarity. And like I say, there's things about Denmark, I'm sure... Um, that are not so great. But I tell you, they care more about their people overall than we do here overall. We only care about a very, very small sliver of people. Those are the, the super rich, the, the uh, folks making eight figures, seven figures. We really don't care too much about the other 99% of us. I mean, we as a country, not we as you and me, you and I. But Denmark became the first country on this planet to ban the AstraZeneca vaccine, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, because of the blood clots that had been the blood clots that had been happening. Women had been getting severe blood clots. And again, I know that Surgeon General Vivek Murthy can say whatever he chooses. Well, it's just six cases, as he said about the Johnson Johnson blood clots. Oh, it's just six cases out of 6.8 million. But what if you're one of the six people? It ain't just six cases if you're one of the six. It ain't rare. Oh, it's rare because it's six out of 6.8 million. Well, it ain't rare if you're one of the six people who have the severe blood clot. So Denmark has done the right thing with AstraZeneca. Good for them. And by the way, the United States has done the right thing with Johnson & Johnson. It is being paused now in a number of states. So the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is not being used in a vast majority of the states now, if not all of them. And, you know, I think that's about right. 
I really think that's what should be done. And again, it brings up the question that I think I introduced yesterday or the day before, which was about the profit system around all of this. Because these vaccines were being introduced and ballyhooed. And now come to find out there's the, all these, these blood clots. Six to me is a lot of blood. Now look, if you're going to say it out of 6.8 million, you're going to go, uh, but six cases of severe blood clotting, that should be alarming to you. That really is six too many. So I am glad that the CDC and FDA a couple of days ago now introduced that statement, issued that statement, I should say, um, about um, recommending a pause. And that's what's happening. I should add one thing very quickly about the state of New Mexico. The state of New Mexico has uh, this time become the second fastest, the second highest rate, the state with the second highest rate of full vaccination. In fact, they are actually the state with the highest rate of full vaccinations, according to the New York Times. That's incredibly great. The only higher rate of vaccination at all is New Hampshire. Now, nearly 38% of New New Mexico adults are fully vaccinated, according to a story here from yesterday, April 14th, written by, oh dear, I forget this person's, uh, (laughs) who the author is, but nonetheless, this New York Times article, How New Mexico Became the State with the Highest Rate of Full Vaccinations, is one I think you should read. It's going to be in the newsletter. It's from yesterday. Um, and forgive me for not remembering the author's name. Don't have it to ha- to memory at the minute. Sorry. Um, but New Mexico, which is a state that's heavily populated with Native Americans, obviously, and um, Latino. Has- I hate the word Hispanic. I think that's such an offensive word. And I just said it and I apologize. Latino groups. And these, as I've said, are the groups with the the highest and most severe rates of infection from coronavirus, COVID-19, along with black people. Now, Native Americans and Latinos account for 60% of the population of New Mexico. So these are the groups of people who need the vaccinations the most. And it's happening. That is a success story. And I'm here to celebrate it. I'm really happy about this. 38% of, nearly 38% of New Mexico adults are fully vaccinated. That's more than any other state in these United States. That's excellent. And I want to thank the governor. um, I believe that is Michelle Lujan Grisham, who, by the way, has 20 plus years of expertise in health, human services, all these kinds of things in her state and everything. And yet she didn't get to be Health and Human Services Secretary, Javier Becerra did instead. And look, Javier Becerra was the Attorney General of this state here, California. And he became HHS, Health and Human Services Secretary. Now look, I I would have much rather have Michelle Lujan Grisham. But there we go. Becerra was not the worst Attorney General we've had here in California. And Michelle Lujan Grisham is still Governor of New Mexico. I want to thank her and, and all the people in the state who have fought for this, including the Native American populations, including Latino populations, because this is a really good thing. It's a really good thing. And it's important to salute that when it happens, because I do, believe it or not. So <laughs> that's, a, that's a really good thing. The highest rate of vaccinations except for one state, is New Ham- is New Mexico. The other new, one of the other news, there's like five states with the word new in it, right? Four, five, I think it's four. New Mexico, New York, New Jersey, New Hampshire. That's four. Maybe there's another one somewhere, but I don't think so. But anyway, so of the new states, of any state in the country, there's only one other state with a higher rate of full, of a higher rate of vaccination. That's New Hampshire. New Hampshire. But the state with the most people fully vaccinated is New Hampshire. Excuse me, is New Mexico. 
Let me say that again. The state with the most people fully vaccinated is New Mexico. That's excellent. And I'm so glad for that because I'm fed up of having to read stories about rich people who don't need this vaccination. I mean, everybody needs it. Let me not say that. That's not fair. That's not fair. That's wrong. Everybody needs this vaccination. So that's why everybody listening, you really should get this vaccination. You really should. Please, can you do it for me? Please, pretty please, with with sugar on top. Sprinkles, a berry, a cherry. Could you please do it? Thank you. Could you? There's so many people dying. There's so many people dying. Come on. Come on now. I know I know you can do it. To those who need to hear this, I know you can do this. You can get vaccinated. You should get vaccinated. You must get vaccinated. Please. I am just so, so happy about this news from New Mexico. Because it means that the people who really must get this vaccine immediately, that's how I'll put it, are getting this vaccine immediately. And it is the Native American populations. It is the Latino populations who are the ones suffering the most. And it is the black populations of this country who are suffering the most. And as I said before, Native Americans, Latinos and black folk, all One, two, and three in that order. And very closely lumped together. One, two, and three. High, high high rates. I told you um, earlier this week or last that black women are getting this virus at higher rates than any other group of people, including Native Americans, including Latinos. And black men are getting this virus at higher rates than anybody. You know, so, you know, please get vaccinated. And so, and this is according to some studies done last week and and, and, and I think last month. And the Harvard gender science study that I also cited earlier this week or last week. I mean, this is, this is serious, folks. So when there's good news, when there is good news, like the fact that... Um, President Biden's goal of 100 million has been shattered, like the fact that his goal now, his new goal of 200 million before his 100th day, which is going to be exactly two weeks from today, is going to be shattered too. I mean, it's going to be shattered. I mean, it's going to be shattered. So there's no two ways about it. It's going to happen. And so... You know, it's it's just, it's going to happen. I mean, right now, as of yesterday, 178 million people in the United States received at least one dose of vaccine for coronavirus. So, hello. If we are now, according to the WhiteHouse.gov website, at 178 million people as of April the 14th, that was yesterday, who have received at least one shot of the COVID-19 vaccination, whether it's Johnson & Johnson, which is now paused, whether it's, you know, Moderna, whether it is, you know, whether it's Pfizer. 178 million people, I'm telling you. By the time we get to Monday or Tuesday of next week, which will be what? The 18th, the 19th is Monday. By the time we get to Monday or Tuesday, which will be the 20th, we will have reached 200 million people. I mean, this is going to be, he's going to blow through this. That is a tremendous accomplishment. I'm sorry. And I don't care whether people like President Biden, whether they think he's not done well, whether they think he's done great. And I happen to be someone who thinks that President Biden thus far has done pretty damn well. I have some quibbles, as we all do. it. I shouldn't say quibbles because it sounds like it's trivial. I have some, there's some things like any politician. You should always have, not just because you want to have them, but because they really do exist in real world and in real time. 
You should raise issues when there are some to be raised. The attacks in Syria, you know, the delaying of withdrawing the military personnel from Afghanistan for five months almost. You should have some questions. And you should say, well, you know, President Biden, I'm not with you here. Well, uh, whatever politician I voted for, I'm not with you here. And tell them you're not with them. They work for you, right? It shouldn't be that, oh, we're all happy all the time about something that President Biden or another Democrat's done. It should be if we should praise them for that. I'm not saying that, dear listener. I'm saying that when they do things that aren't right, you should not pretend it doesn't happen and you should not be silent about it. If you want to make the country better, you have to start by making yourself better. You've got to start by putting pressure on these politicians, the ones you voted for, not just the ones you vote against because they suck and because they're fascist. And because they are all kinds of other things, racist, misogynist, transphobic, it's and homophobic. It's because you, you want you want to be always fine tuning and pushing and, and agitating. You can't just rest on your laurels. I believe in playtime. Trust me. I believe in having fun and, and doing good things um, that don't involve work. <laughs> you know? I believe in that. I do that, and that otherwise that keeps you going. Otherwise, how the heck could you function, right? But I'm sorry, when it comes to politics and voting, we have to keep going. We've got Republicans all over the country, nearly 400 pieces of legislation, as Senator Maisie Hirono said yesterday, that have been introduced by Republicans to suppress votes in this country, to suppress the votes of the same communities I just talked about, the Native communities, the Latino communities, and the black communities. Primarily, all of those three groups. Now, there are others like the youth, like the elderly, like also some Asians, a lot of Asians actually now. Same goes for them. They're trying to block all of us, mate. So we've got to have a stake in this, and there's an election coming up next year. So, yeah, I think President Biden has done well, and I haven't really in the last week or two talked about whether he's had a good week or a bad week. I think he's had a more of a good week this week. Um, than than not. But um, look, we have to, whether it's your local politician in your city council, um, your school board person, keep challenging them to be honest. Keep them honest. That's my message. Keep them honest. Do not rest. You know, 2022 is around the corner. Here in California, we've got a governor's race. Um, They're trying to recall Gavin Newsom. I've told you, again, I've told you, you know very well, dear listener, that I have there's things with Gavin Newsom that I have made, and I've said them to him on Twitter, not that he reads my tweets or any, <laughs> to his staff, that, look, this is just not good enough. But I've also praised him when he halted the death penalty in this state. Now, I want it to be abolished completely, but under this governor, at least, I know that no one's getting executed by the state, although there are police who are doing that state execution on a daily basis in California, I'm sure. We just haven't seen the videos for them. So we have to engage. I think that's my whole point. And so I'm very pleased about this vaccination story in the New York Times that was written. Uh, about. Oh, I'm pleased about New Mexico, first and foremost. It's a lovely state, by the way. Um, if you've never been to New Mexico, take a when you travel again after you've been Um, because I traveled there years ago. Gosh, it's been about 20 years. It's been more than 20 years since I was in New Mexico. (sighs) My gosh, that's a long time. 20 years goes by like that. I mean, it really goes by like that, like that, like that second one. Um, Gosh, it's really beautiful, though. Native American land. You know, we walk on Native American land every single day if you are here listening to this in the United States. And my goodness me, you know, we really, many of us take it for granted, don't we? If we're being honest. Oh my gosh. It's, New Mexico's lovely. Taos, oh my gosh. Lovely, lovely, lovely. The views, the mountains, oh, just it's just lovely. New Mexico's just beautiful. It really is. Anyway, shout out to everybody in New Mexico. Those of you listening, thank you for doing so. It's, it's just a lovely state. 
and the native communities there. Oh, this is your land, you know? It's your land. And I don't care what anybody says. It's their land. It's their land. You know? It's their land. Anyway. I um, want to say that is a great job out in New Mexico. Long may it continue. I'll be right back. Sad news. Corey Gauthier, the student at LSU, um, was found dead. Um, I haven't talked about Corey Gauthier uh, and I was wanting to do that this week, and I should have. So I, I apologize for not getting to it. And now, sadly, she's been found dead in uh, Baton Rouge or thereabouts. It's really sad. It's a very sad story. This is a young person with so much ahead of her in life, you know? It's just so sad. And I, I heard this news yesterday on social media. I, I got it. Um, it just hit me like a ton of bricks. I, 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 you don't have to know someone to be affected by their passing. You don't have to, really. You really don't. Corey Gauthier, um, someone who had the world at her feet. <sighs> a body found in the Mississippi River <sighs> is identified as 18-year-old LSU freshman Corey Gauthier. She went missing just last week. This is heartbreaking. Oh my gosh. I I, I can't, I I almost, I'm starting, the tears are welling up in my eyes, dear listener. This is something. And I'm sure they're welling up in yours, some of you. If you you see, I'm not, I, I know, I didn't know Corey. I didn't know Corey Gautier. She went missing on April 7th. Her car was found on top of the Mississippi River Bridge. According, when it was struck by another vehicle, according to the university, Louisiana State University, in a Facebook post. And the weird thing is, and this is really suspicious to me, is that the Baton Rouge police never notified Corey Gautier's family that her car had been found on the Mississippi River Bridge. Never notified them, which is really strange. Now, why the hell wouldn't you do that? So they didn't, right? They didn't notify the family. And so the family and other people um, at... um, LSU and their police department did all this other investigation. Oh, oh my God. I mean, this is just, I, 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 anyway, this is just too much. Yeah, I, I can't even continue reading this because it's going to be bad. <laughs> it's going to be really bad and I don't want it to be. Um, it's going to be bad. So, you know, I can't imagine, I, I don't want to start... Here I am centering myself very dangerously here because the family is who I think of. And my dear, deepest condolences to the family of Corey Gautier. Oh, my goodness me. Their loss and their pain is so deep. And I can't even imagine how deep, but it is very deep. I can only think it must be. Um, Corey's uncle posted a video to social media um, thanking the community for rallying around the family. Oh, my God. Oh, not the quote, not the end result that we were hoping for, but at least we have her body and can start the healing process. And he added, you know, quote, this is a tough video to make. But thanks for everything that was done. And thanks for all the prayers. Rest in power, Corey Gauthier. K. 
Kim Potter, who you know resigned, um, the uh, murderer resigning from the police department there in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota. She yesterday was charged with second degree manslaughter. I mean, give me a break. Second degree manslaughter for what she did. There is video that you may have seen. I've only seen a portion of it. Um, I don't even want to really see the whole thing, but it's very clear to me. Um, I turned the sound down and it's very clear to me. She has that gun out forever, as you heard on the audio that I played at the end of yesterday's episode. From the nephew, from the aunt, excuse me, of Dante Wright. Uh, the aunt name is the aunt's name is Naisha Wright, and she's absolutely correct. I mean, th- this is a murder. It, there's no doubt about it. And as I've said, uh, well, I'm saying it now here. I've said it to people uh, in conversation, but I'll say it here. Um, this was completely orchestrated by Kim Potter. The when she shouts out, "Taser, taser, taser!" In my view, and in a lot of other people's view. She shouts that out as a cover to protect herself. Because her excuse in her trial will be, oh, it was an accident because I shouted taser, 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 but I shot him with a gun. So in my view and in a lot of other people's views, Kim Potter deliberately murdered Dante Wright. And had and had made the calculation before she killed him that she was going to shout out taser, taser, taser as a pretext for a defense, knowing that she was going to then kill him. And you don't have to form intent over five minutes or premeditate it. It can happen within an instant. I mean, this happens when police say, drop it, or gun, gun, gun. Same thing. That's happened a million times when we've been shot dead. Some white cop or some any cop shouts out, gun, gun, gun. And then that gives them license to blow away somebody. It gives them, not. I don't think it gives them license. I'm just saying in their minds, that gives them, they think they're now entitled to kill. So someone can just shout that out and lie. And that's happened many times where police have lied and shouted out the words gun, gun, gun. When the black person doesn't have anything in their hands, no gun, they plant one after you've killed that brother or sister, but they don't have a weapon. They don't have anything. And some cop, gun, 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 and they shoot and kill us. Oh yeah, that's the thing. That really does go down in the United States of America. And it goes down freaking every, every blooming day, day, day. It happened in a case not too long ago, actually. And I think it was caught on video. And it happened at night, I think, uh, or dr- and they shouted, gun, gun, gun. And they killed this brother when he had nothing. He had nothing, even if he had a gun, right? Again, I always, this whole thing about armed, unarmed, because it's not used for white people. And they're armed to the teeth. They walk down the street, open carry. They've got their rifles. They walk into the Michigan legislature with their freaking AKs or ARs or whatever, or their rifles, rather, Stuck to their freaking vests. They got a pistol here. They got a nine there. They got a Glock here. And they're not ever called armed. And they're never called unarmed. Right? They're never even called armed when they've got all that material. All that and that gun, that weaponry on them. Oh, it's open carry. And they're armed to the teeth. And it's never an unarmed white person, is it? They're armed when they come up to you, when they come to these cops with axes and swords and knives and their vehicles. They're all armed. Oh, but that's just, you know, and then the police, they don't shoot them. They don't shoot them and they're armed and still no one calls them armed. (laughs) Still not in the media, not every, not anybody. That's why I keep talking about language, dear listener. And who are using the language on and for what reasons and why, 
right? And the who, what, the who, what, why, and what the hell, right? Now, this is part of the what the hell part of this podcast episode. What the hell is that? Right? We don't call any of the white people that carry weapons armed, barely, right? And when the police are with, uh, dealing with them, no one says anything about armed versus unarmed. But it's only us, right? Armed. Oh, oh, he was unarmed. She was unarmed. And and it's black folk repeating this nonsense too. Oh, well, uh, oh, well, they were unarmed black people. What if they had a weapon though? What if it was open carry? They're armed then. But they'd still be shot dead. And even if it wasn't an open carry state in this country, the US of A, and they're walking down the street and they've got a gun and they have a permit for it, Philando Castile, they're still shot dead. Philando Castile, and this happened in Minnesota, folks, for those of you scoring at home, actually was telling Officer Yanez, that piece of garbage who didn't get any jail time, was found not guilty was telling him, officer, I'm just going to go and get my my permit to show you that I have a gun and here's my permit. And then off this, this piece of garbage blasts him away right there in front of his four-year-old daughter, right there in front of his girlfriend who are in the back seat with a front row or a back row seat to this whole horror that is playing out before them. Only it's not a movie. It is real. And they've just seen a cop absolutely murder their son, or rather in this case, their father and their boyfriend in one fell swoop. Boom, gone. And it was all caught on Facebook Live by the girlfriend. It's just, you know, so even when we're armed and we're telling you, right? So you still kill us. So like I say, this armed, unarmed garbage, you got to stop that, folks. And I'm saying this to everybody, including black folk, including these black politicians. Well, he's an unarmed black person. Listen, he's a black person. Listen, she's a black person. Listen, they are black people. Uh, they are human beings. I do not want to hear about, ooh, they're armed, they're unarmed. I'm telling you, I want that distinction gone here because it's got to be about the way these police are behaving. And it ain't about whether we're armed or whether we're not armed. Don't put the onus on us. If it, It's one thing if a brother or a sister or someone is out there waving a gun at people and pointing it at a cop. That's one thing, right? But it's quite another if we're walking down the street and we have a weapon and it's not being in use, we're not doing anything with it and they kill us. It, it, we're reaching for uh, our compartment to show our permit and we're blown away. We're told by a cop to go back into our vehicle and get our license and registration and then we're shot at eight times in Georgia. You can see this on YouTube. We're told to get out of our car in Texas and we're Sandra Bland and we never see the light of day again for a freaking turn signal. We get out of our car and we're blown away and it's all about an air freshener. So I don't want to hear about armed, unarmed, and getting out of cars or not getting out. We stay in our car, we get killed. We get out of our car, we get killed. George Floyd. Dante Wright. Sandra Bland. Terrence Crutcher. Alton Sterling. We, we stay in our car, we get killed. Philander Castile. Sam DeBose. What are we supposed to do as black people? What are we supposed to do? 
What are we supposed to do? And then you've got Kim Porter. Potter. Potter. I wonder if she is from the Hogwarts school. Because I don't think the Hogwarts school teaches people to murder each other. Do, 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 you, do you think the Hogwarts school... Do you think J.K. Rowling drew that up in her playbook? And no, I'm not trying to be facetious here. Potter, Potha, is her last name. Oh, and now the media's calling her Kimberly. Oh, Kimberly. Oh, Kimberly Porter. Potter. Kimberly Potter. Oh, so now we're going to call her Kimberly. Did you see that mugshot of her? It's in yesterday's newsletter. April 14th, 2021. The newsletter. Please subscribe again. I'm going to repeat. It's politocrat.substack.com. Subscribe now for free. And there's the mugshot. Or you can look, find it anywhere. But I put it in the newsletter for yesterday. The fact that she's being charged with second degree murder is an out... Excuse me. Second degree manslaughter is an outrage. And in Minnesota, that carries exactly 10 whopping years. 10 whopping years. She'll be out before dinner time at this rate if she's convicted. Because you know they've got to do that first, right? And how many cops ever get convicted, especially of killing black people? Few and far between. It is almost non-existent. I talked about that case in Kentucky from about four, five, four or five years ago where that white cop got convicted. It's extremely rare. Extremely rare. And even then, and also, of course, Amber Geiger, who is not going to serve... Listen. For, remember when she walked into Beauf and Jean's apartment and blew him away at close range. And she got get, found guilty and got a sentence of 10 years. And you know she's not going to serve even five years of that sentence. All she have to do is bat her eyelids a couple of times and it's over. I mean, honestly, I know people are going to go, oh, you think she's going to. I'm talking metaphorically. She is going, she's going to be on her best behavior and they'll be all over it. She may even give some of these prison guards something that they've been looking for. Shit, you don't think that happens? You don't think that happens? And, and, and it gets worse than that. And a lot of that and worse happens. Much, much worse. In other words, not consent. In other words, rape. And I'm telling you, there's all kinds of stuff. I just talked about the penitentiaries earlier. You don't think this stuff goes on? She'll be out of prison, by the way, again, before you know it. Separate and aside, she'll she'll be out, Amber Geiger, before five years are up. I'm telling you. And the same thing with Kim Potter. She's going to be out, trust me, before... Now, Muhammad Noor... The black cop who shot and killed the white woman named Justine Demont. Not so much. His ass is going to serve the full 10 years. And by the way, they should serve the full. I, I'm all for that. I'm glad. He, he should have got, you know, if the Minnesota law was stronger, he should have got more than the 10 years. And he claimed that was an accident. She walks up to the car or she's by it. He's in the vehicle and the, and the bullet goes through and kills her. Really? I didn't see any police union back in his ass. His black ass was left to, well, you know what I, you know what I'm saying, what I'm thinking. Blowing in the wind, except not on the ground in the wind. And no one was back in his ass. Back the blue. That wasn't happening in the case of Muhammad Noor. And I had did the whole episode yesterday about good cops, bad cops. And I told you about those two great cops who are good cops. There are some good cops in the world. I'm going to get to that in a few short minutes, I promise. But I talked about that a lot yesterday with the two very good people named Cariel Horn and... Lieutenant Cheryl Orange. Carol Horn, I told you about, former Buffalo Police Department officer, remember? She pulled a white cop off of a man who had been handcuffed, that the white cop had his neck 
in a chokehold and was trying to kill him. A brother who was about to die. And Carol Horn, as a fellow police officer standing next to him, said, am I going to sit here and watch this and have a front row seat to it? Or am I actually going to do something? Am I going to be a coward like Thomas Lane and uh, Officer Kang and Officer Tao in Minneapolis? Or am I going to actually stop this killing from happening? Because the guy's already in handcuffs. You don't need to be putting him in a chokehold in a rev- in, from behind, too. The guy couldn't breathe, Neil Mack. He couldn't. And so... Carrie Horn said, I'm going to pull this fellow officer, in quotes, off of this brother. And they call him a suspect. Oh, the suspect. Why don't you just call him a person? Because we may find out that that guy had nothing to do with anything. But that's the way, again, language, folks, the way we think and the way we speak about people. I know the law deems him as a suspect because he's suspected. But why don't we change the way we frame this? Call him the accused. Call him whatever. And I guess that's a legal term because, it. well, maybe not. It's the term that gets used when someone is on trial. So then that is then when he or she or they become the accused. But I want a change in the language. I think we should speak a different language around all of these things and more. Which is one of the reasons why I do irritate people with the constant reframing of the language I'm sure I piss people off with that maybe I don't, maybe I do but it's important for us to speak a different language about all of these things words really do matter and they can hurt ooh, can they hurt you can testify to that I can testify to that we all can testify to that in many ways, myriad ways but Carol Horn decided to save someone's life Those officers in Minneapolis didn't. They were part of the show. All they needed and all that was missing was the popcorn. Kim Potter is a murderer. And 10 years is not enough. It's just not enough time. She's already out on $100,000 bond. And that's another insult. $100,000 bond? Not a million, not two, not five, not ten. I mean, my goodness gracious me, if we've dropped a banana peel, if I'm dropped if I've dropped a banana peel, ha ha ha, if I've dropped a banana peel on the sidewalk, my bail would be higher than hers. My bond would be higher than hers. And she murdered somebody. I mean, how many times have you seen? Well, the defendant has been remanded in custody to the con- the court county prison on $2.5 million bond. Good luck. See her at trial. See her at trial. And you know they can't afford, you know the average person can't afford that. And you know that a brother or a sister a per- can't afford that. Can't afford that kind of money. Where are they getting that from? Oprah? Who's giving them $2.5 million to bail them out, to bond them out? Who's doing that? Exactly. And so they go and they're in the system. The system, the system, the system. I'm going to get into that now. This is where I start to transition into the system, right? And you're going to be hearing from someone who is right where I am. And I didn't know that this person was. I suspected, suspect, or I used that word. I thought, I believed, and I'm not surprised that they line up in this way. But, however, I want you to listen to what they have to say. Because it's ordinarily what I would say. In fact, I said this to someone in a conversation I had yesterday. Now, Instead of me saying it, though, I think it'll be better to hear from this person. And you'll hear from them right after this. I want to get now to 
who you're going to hear next. And I'll tell you who it is. It's Trevor Noah. Trevor Noah of The Daily Show. Um, you're going to be hearing from him here in this audio, which is posted on online. Um, but you've got to listen to this. This is Trevor Noah saying some of the very things that I've been saying here. Certainly yesterday I've said it. Certainly I think uh, in this episode you'll find that I've said it. And some of the things that you probably have said and have thought and have tweeted and have talked about with people you know. Roll the sound on this, please. What's going on, everybody? I've been watching these um, police encounters that have been all over the news over the past few days. The question I kept finding myself asking when I was watching the video of of the lieutenant who gets pulled over by the cops. He's in military fatigues, right? one of the troops. He's being treated trash by the cops and not like just as a troop, as a human being, he's being treated like trash. They claim they were afraid, but there's only one person exhibiting fear in that video and it's him. And I found myself watching that video over and over again and I realized it's because I had one question that, that kept on nagging in my brain. And the question was, where are the good apples? Because we're told time and time again that these incidents that black Americans are experiencing are because of bad apples, right? There are bad apples in these police departments who are doing these things. They they use chokeholds that are not allowed. They they use excessive force. They, they, they're, they're violent in their words and their actions to the people they're meant to be protecting and serving. These are bad apples. We've got to root them out of the force. My question though is, where are the good apples? If we're meant to believe that the police system in America, the system of policing itself is not fundamentally broken, then we would need to see good apples. And by the way, I'm not saying that there are no good policemen. Don't get me wrong. I'm asking where the good apples are. And what I mean by that is, where are the cops who are stopping the cop from putting their knee on George Floyd's neck? Because there's not one cop at that scene. There's one cop who's on trial, but there's not one cop at that scene. You know, where are the other cops when Philando Castile is losing his life? Like, where, where are the cops? You know, where are, the, where are the good apples? Because it's funny how we live in a society where people, people who, who defend these cops at all costs will say, oh, black on black crime. And you see these people in their communities, they don't care. That, but go to any black community any disenfranchised community in america and you will find people marching against that same crime you'll find community leaders you'll find parents you'll find you'll find siblings you find people constantly saying please we need to stop this crime we need to stop the gangs we, you see the community doing something i mean the, the fact they call 911 when something happens that tells you something but i don't seem to see that with the cops we don't see a mass uprising of police saying, let's root out these people. We don't see videos of police officers stopping the other cop from pushing an old man at a Black Lives Matter protest or from beating up a kid in the street with a baton. We don't see that. So my question is, where are the good apples? And honestly, I believe we don't see them not because there are no good people on the police force. I think there are many people who are good on the police force. That's why they join because they want to do good. But I think it's because they themselves know that if they do something, they're going against the system. The system is more powerful than any individual. The system in policing is doing exactly what it's meant to do in America. And that is to keep poor people in their place who happens to be the most poor in America, black people. You monetize them, you imprison them, which monetizes them again. It's a system. It's not broken. It's working the way it's designed to work. And once you realize that, I feel like you get to a place where you go, oh, we're not dealing with bad apples. We're dealing with a rotten tree that happens to grow good apples. But for the most part, the tree that was planted is bearing the fruit 
that it was intended to. That was Trevor Noah last night. Um, or at least it was posted uh, on his Twitter account last night. Um, at least on the Daily Shows. It may well be on... I'm sure it was probably also on his own Twitter account, at Trevor Noah, um, the host of The Daily Show. And look, he is absolutely right. And this is exactly what I was have been saying and what I will reiterate here. I'm not going to re- repeat <laughs> what, what uh, Trevor just said, but he said it very well. And, uh, you know, this is... Trevor Noah's from South Africa, so he knows firsthand... He's written a book called Born a Crime. He talks about all of these things that happened in South Africa to him and his experiences growing up there in apartheid, in apartheid, apartheid, South Africa. But you don't have to be from South Africa to know this, right? You don't have to be. You could be from Mars. You could be a Martian who spent just a week here. If a Martian dropped down from Mars into the United States, just last Saturday, and has stayed there, here on planet Earth, has stayed here on planet Earth, through today, April 15th, 2021, that Martian could tell you exactly what America was all about. And it would have only taken that Martian barely, barely five days, five plus days to figure that out. Six days to figure that out. That we have a system here that is working extraordinarily well. Like a well-oiled killing machine. That's how the system works, folks. It's not broken at all. It is a well-oiled killing machine. It's really well-oiled. And it is doing exactly what it's designed to do. Which is to kill black people. To oppress black people to kill brown people, to oppress brown people. They're throwing Asians behind barbed wire or, or rather behind internment camps and concentration camps in the 1950s, in internment camps. We're throwing brown people into concentration camps right now or had been, certainly during the Donald, uh, during Donald Trump. We, they're still in there now under Biden, by the way. You know, they're still in there, some of them. A lot of them have been released, but there are still some there. But again, this is a whole system. The penitentiary that I talked about earlier. The incarceration, you know, put into the penitentiary. Incarceration. That's all systemic. The, you know, the death penalty. A killing machine, I say. A killing machine. That's what the system is. Putting people to death who are innocent. Putting people to death, period. Whether they're innocent or whether they're not. Oh, whoops, we made a mistake. Oh, he's been fried. Too bad he was innocent. I mean, having only one abortion clinic in a whole state. That's the system, right? But in this case, I'm talking about where we are dying out here. Can't walk out of our car, we're going to get killed. Can't walk out of our car, we don't want to get out, we get pepper sprayed. And we're wearing our Lieutenant Army uniform, we're wearing our uniform and telling these sick people, these evil people that, hey, I'm on duty, I'm on tour, I'm a Lieutenant in the United States Army, I'm a Lieutenant. Well, you should obey. I've been there too, and I, and I was a veteran, and you should obey. Really? That's the thing you say? I said this before. You've heard me say this before in the previous episode. And I, and I know they fired that guy, but that's what the system is going to do when we pressure it to do that. And it just continues to then go ahead after they fired the one or two people to continue perpetuating what it does. It never fires itself. The system doesn't resign. System's never resigned. It never will resign. And you don't try to reform a well-oiled killing machine. The system is a killing machine. You don't reform a killing machine. You just don't do that.
Who does that? You don't reform a, well, I guess our politicians do, or they try to. You don't reform a well-oiled killing machine. You get rid of it. You destroy it. You get rid of it. You destroy it. That's what you do to a killing machine. And that's what this system is. Because black people and brown people are continuing to get murdered out here by police. And the police are getting away with it. Because the system designed is designed for them to get away with it. Because that is the system. The system is a bunch of criminals. The system is a bunch of people who are disgusting people. And yes, it's about oppressing black people. It's also about keeping these racist, evil, violent people in power who are white men and some white women who won't let go of their family empires and won't do that. It's their own private fiefdom. These oligarchs, these people. And that's the system that they have created. That's what this is. And we need to end that system. We need to end it. I'm all in favor of abolishing these violent police. Yes. Because every family, if I mean, every family that gets affected by this, it's, a fam- it's too many families. One is too many, but we have this every single day. There's ones that we don't even know about who have been killed. Dante Wright was a boy. I'm sorry, 20 years old, I know they say, oh, he's a man. Look at those photos of him. Look at those photos of him. He's a kid. He's a kid. He's a child. And Kim Potter. Oh, taser, taser, taser. These are all police things. These are all systemic. All of that shouting. Oh, these are the procedures of Minnesota police. These are all systemic things that end up resulting in the murders of black people. So you can shout in some states, as some cops do in many states, gun, gun, gun. You can lie. Oh, I'm going to lie and say gun, gun, gun when I really want to kill this black person. But let me create an excuse beforehand and say that he had a gun or she had a gun. And I can shout gun, gun, gun when I didn't see a gun, when there was no gun there. And now it just gives me license to blow him away, blow her away, blow Amadou Diallo on the stoop of his apartment building away because he had a freaking wallet in his hand and I can't see and I'm on the police force. That's systemic, folks. This isn't about bad. That's what Trevor Noah was getting at. This isn't about bad apples or even good ones. It's about a system. And I'm really thankful um, that Trevor Noah lined because he has a much bigger platform than I do. <laughs> of course. Uh, dear, here I am centering myself again. He, he has a huge platform and he's using it the way I think that I, look, I'll say it like this. He's using the platform to help people, to educate people, to wake people up. The system is a well-oiled killing machine. Thank you very much for listening to this edition of The Politocrat. I'm Omar Moore.